Hey everybody, welcome to Wargroove. We're gonna do some incredible games. We're gonna do the three sets from the top eight. These will decide the top four players in the world. The only ones I'm not doing, actually, out of this bunch, are my own sets against Spotius because for, it, it's because it's hard to replay your own games. But we're gonna do Psychoia versus Zeronix, games two and three, because I already did game one in the other video. We're gonna do Alsame Suzaku versus Spacefront, and we're gonna do Shu versus Time Key. These, these sets will decide the top four in the world, so let's get started. Remember, all of these sets, all of these sets are best of three. So you have to win two, and then you take the game. Let's start out in Headland to Deadland with World Champion Shu defending their title against Time Key. Alright, in the bottom left we've got Shu playing Dark Mercia. Dark Mercia is an interesting commander, said to be one of the worst in the game, but has some very potent lethal potential if you know what you're doing. Time Key in the top right in the red here is playing Mercia. I'm going to keep the high speed on, guys, just for the first couple of turns, but now that they've captured those villages, I'm going to slow it down to make for a much better watching experience. There we go. All right, so Shu is going for a pretty delayed opening here, actually sending that sword back to grab that village, and then just sending the single sword up to maybe get a village or two. Timekey heals Mercia very early on this village here, it's a very interesting strategy. Both players are going right for the center of the map. No, Shu is actually ditching the center and going to the right to help take down these villages over here, and Dark Mercia hasn't even healed yet. Time Key just grabbing villages where they can. Looks like this one here might be contested. It depends how they position this sword. Retreating and defending villages here. Both players about even on the map. We see Shu taking this village out with just a couple of swords, and an early knight comes out to set up a crit on this six village, giving Shu pressure on both sides of the map. This will give Shu an early econ lead. Let's look at that. Shu is 100 gold ahead right now. Time Key is doing their best to take down this village and likewise take it down with swords, building a bunch of units to secure this village and hold a lead. They snipe one of Shu's swords. But oh no, their own sword can get wrecked by Dark Mercia very safely from the mountain, giving Dark Mercia a ton of groove. Dark Mercia is a slow charge commander, but already at 50%. The mage just finishes off, finishes off that sword. Knight takes the village, and now the sword goes into the other sword, dropping it to four. Shu has completely taken over the top and uh, bottom corners of the map. Time Key very cleverly uses every unit to kill that mage to make their harpy temporarily invincible. Bringing out more dogs to deal with all these swords and building a second harpy. Time Key is determined not to lose the top left and has given up on the bottom right. Time Key bringing out more mages and harpies to try to contend with Time Key's ever growing air force and sends units forward, capturing a village in full view of Mercia. Now, since Mercia already has Groove, that's fine. You're not risking giving her any more Groove. And Shu takes out another village with their commander, already at 75% for a slow charge commander. Using the Harpies to do some free damage to these swords, Time Key is reclaiming the north. But sadly, with only a pike to capture villages, it'll be really hard to grab these two, and it'll take a couple of turns. Double Harpy to kill one sword. But hey, it worked! We see Shu almost as Groove, using their own Harpy to take out a village, and then just ballooning pikes, sending out mages. They've got a knight. They have all kinds of units on the top left, and they've completely controlled the top right. If we take a look at the economy here, Shu is dominating. 500 income up. And they end their turn even on non-village unit count. Time Key has got to do something, or they are going to just lose this game. We see units coming out and swords damaging themselves to take out these villages. That's fine, because Mercia can heal them using her groove. That was a pretty cheap groove. Uh, Time Key really didn't get much out of it. But ultimately, they have to do something to retake this game. Ooh, that, that harpy position, very dangerous. The mage can definitely kill one of the harpies, which will be very efficient for Shu. And the knight takes out another village and is standing right next to Time Key's stronghold. 
The harpy comes over. The mage doesn't even kill a harpy. It's just not worth it. Instead, Shu just sends up a defensive position and starts moving in on the stronghold. Shu is just like, I don't care about your army. Psh, I'm going to take all of your money. Time key doing everything they can to try to reclaim this. They use a pike crit to re-grab one of the villages, start sending some of the units back. They balloon Mercia back to the stronghold. But now Time Key's already weakened army is split up between three fronts. Over here, over here around the stronghold, and over here. Good use of the weakened harpy to snipe a unit. And we see the mages are nice and protected, so that if Shu comes in with an air force, they can take it down. But Shu doesn't really have much of an air force, except this witch, which is on the other side of the map. So unfortunately, those mages are not doing very much. Shu continues to take this village over and over again, and just sends his units forward to deal as much damage as they can, kind of just stalling. Because Shu can basically play a war of attrition now that they have so much economy. Look at this economy. They're 400 gold up. And there's not a lot Time Key can do. Shu even has Groove on their slow charge commander. This is an incredible game. Very potent. And I just realized the game music is still off. Let me turn that back on for you guys. Time Key using the Doggos to do some damage. Mage critting a knight. But that's not going to kill the knight. And it'll do a lot to the mage. Really, there's just not much Time Key can do to break out of this position. Shu's kind of got them stuck in. They're bringing down a knight for some heavy hitting damage, just spamming mages, but it's not enough. Shu just kills a sword with their commander, heals up their knight, and are sending everything forward to protect Dark Mercia. We see Witch come in, do enough damage to the mage so a pike can take it out. Dog come in to hit that sword, another dog. Dark Mercia is protected on the top, on the bottom, and the left. Dark Mercia is not gonna die today. Now Shu is free to do as much damage as they want all over the map. Deciding not to go in on these two doggies, they just balloon their entire force over here, and now Time Key has nothing they can efficiently attack. Sure, they get a dog crit there, but what else are they gonna do? We see a unit suicide into Dark Mercia, Mercia take out a sword, and Time Key just surrenders. That was a one-sided slaughter. Shu takes game one. I don't think Groove even came into play there. Shu just got such a strong and early lead, there was nothing Time Key could do. Let's go into match two. But hey, I mean, that's the world champion for you, defending their title like they mean business. Alright guys, in the top right, we have Shu playing Dark Mercia again. Not sure why they're doing that, and Time Key playing Greenfinger. I don't know if this is like a sign of disrespect from Shu, like, haha, I could beat you with Dark Mercia. Or if it's more like, I actually think Dark Mercia has potential, and I don't want to reveal my other commander picks for the top four matches. Either way, Shu's been taking games, so you can't really complain. Whatever their strategy is, it seems to be working for them. Dark Mercia slides across the map at very low health, but Shu has some quality positions and is ready to take villages. Their mage snagging a village in the bottom right. Time Key snagging a village in the top left. Time Key has got to not lose the corners of the map this game. The corners of the map are extremely important on this map, which is Sidewinder as well. What's really interesting is Shu did not go for a thief here. You normally build a thief to capture this village. Shu instead goes for an early knight and just takes it out. That strategy is widely accepted to be not as effective as the thief, but it can be used for some heavy tempo. Time Key does the same thing, but brings their knight up, saving the village for the thief, which is going to give Time Key a bit more gold than taking it out with the knight will give Shu. Dark Mercia is not as healthy as Greenfinger, but moves a sword to the center of the map, which Greenfinger can't kill, and built a dragon to murder Greenfinger if Greenfinger stands in the wrong spot. Oh my goodness, is Greenfinger dead? Is Greenfinger dead? I, I can't see the range on this dragon. I think Greenfinger is just out of the range of the dragon. They should be safe. It's hard to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, Greenfinger is safe, and bringing a bunch of units up to defend their stuff. Alright, this is a much more even game, but Shu finds an early pick with their hyper-aggressive dragon, although they sacrifice a sword of their own to take out a village and give Dark Mercy a groove. So unit count-wise, it's pretty even. Village-wise, Shu definitely has the economy once again, owning the entire bottom right of the map, taking a village on the bottom left, and controlling the center. However, the center villages on Sidewinder switch very quickly, as you can see. Time Key gets some groove taking it out with a very safe positioning. And there's nothing really that Dark Mercia or the Dragon can do to attack into this or this. 
Though that dragon is going to be really nice, really nice for Shu, and give them some plays like that, taking out a village that otherwise would have been difficult to decap that turn, and controlling the top left, while they have a knight and a mage controlling the bottom right. Once again, Shu controls both corners of the map. On these very, very corner-intensive maps, I'm realizing both maps they played on are very corner-intensive. And we see Shu gaining some very successful dominance on this map. Time Key just trying to take out villages and maybe recoup their position. We see mages creeping forward because they're they're protected against the dragon. Mages sitting in crit positions all across the map, ready to heal, ready to dish out damage. And Time Key has Groove on Greenfinger. We might see some plays come through. Dark Mercia does not care. Dark Mercia is not afraid. Kills a unit, gets a sword crit on the mage, and then finishes it off with a dragon. That mage was on a mountain tile, and Shu found a way to take it out with something it's supposed to counter. That was really well played by Shu. Shu builds another dragon, abusing their economy to the max. Time Key, though, has a dragon of their own, and is able to do a lot of damage to that mage, but it'll still get a crit on Time Key's dragon, unfortunately, unless they can maybe block it off with a balloon or something. We see the knight sort of retreat, time key sort of back off, but there's still a lot of units in range of Dark Mercia here. Cry. Sure enough, using the balloon to protect this dragon a little bit, and then Greenfinger to completely protect it. I like that, because the mage still could have gone around through the neutral village, but that one vine stops that from happening. Amazing groove from time key. Can time key retake this game? We see pike crit come out on the vines, dealing huge damage. A couple of pikes heading down the road from Shu. And Shu just marching forward with pikes, mages, and a whole bunch of dragons. Dragon actually hurts itself to take this village so the pike doesn't have to. Interesting choice. But Shu is controlling the economy of this game with a stranglehold. Let's take a look at the economy. Shu is ahead, but not by much. Tanki is actually catching up, having retaken the center and the bottom right. Tanki might still be behind, but they have enough for an army, and Sidewinder is a bit of a stally map. I think Time Key might be able to pull this back, having, strictly speaking, a better commander? Although I do wonder if Dark Mercia kind of counters Greenfinger, because he can groove the vines. Shu goes in dealing additional night crits, Dark Mercia smashes. Dark Mercia has groove now, meaning a kill on Greenfinger becomes very possible. Time Key cannot attack recklessly. Shu heals their mage, sends the dragons forward, finishes capturing the top left, and is primed for the attack. Meanwhile, Time Key has this thief primed and ready. Well, Shu didn't build a single thief all game. I wonder what Time Key's gonna do with that thief. It could give them some very well needed eco advantage at a critical moment. They retreat the thief to the mountain on their side and just do everything in their power. Oh, they could have taken out that village with the dragon, but chose instead to send the dragon to the center perhaps thinking that a fight is about to happen. Time Key builds a Ballista to help defend against these dragons. That's going to do really well. It'll zone the dragons out of this entire territory around here. Um, and with mages, uh, this is pretty much a no-go zone for dragons. So the dragons will probably move to the center of the map, where Time Key only has two mages and an archer to contend with them. Sure enough, the dragons move towards the right and center, where there are much less threats that can hurt them. We see double archer coming in from Shu. Um, one of them positioned where a balloon can carry it further forward. And Shu's just kind of biding their time, slowly moving forward and dealing the pikes. But Shu doesn't want to spend a lot of time positioning themselves. They're happy with their current position. Time Key retakes economy! Okay, this is very important because they are even on economy and units and Time Key hasn't built yet. Meaning that actually right now at this point in the game they are dead even, with the exception of the fact that Shu has Groove. Also, I think Shu's army value and army composition is overall better. Shu has two dragons to Time Key's one. Shu has triple archers to Time Key's one. Shu has more pikes. Shu has fewer mages but doesn't need as many. And there's the Dark Mercia groove. Huge damage coming in. Are we going to see a kill on Greenfinger right here? It's definitely possible. We might see double dragon into Greenfinger. Mage shield comes down on the dragon. I think that's what we're looking at. Boom! One dragon hit goes down. Second dragon hit. I think it was possible for that to fail, but it did not. Good odds on that. Shu takes game two. 
and in a very impressive display showing exactly why they are the world champion, Shu takes out Time Key to make it to the top four. Well played, Time Key. Your opponent was just insanely good. All right, so we saw Shu versus Time Key. Let's get into a match nobody ex nobody knew what to expect from Alsame Suzaku versus Spacefront. Now, Alsame Suzaku was heralded as one of the best players on par with Shu um, towards the end of 1.3. But they haven't done as well in tournaments because they weren't as good on the clock. Their opponent, Spacefront, the number one ladder player, has the exact same problem, the clock. So let's pay attention to the time as we go into their first game. All right, we see another Headlands to Deadlands match. Um, we see it's a Valder duo, a Valder mirror match. In the bottom, in blue, we have Spacefront. Remember, their username is Martin, um, but they're registered as Spacefront. I, I think it's a Switch thing. They can't change their name on Switch. So just remember, I'm talking about Martin when I say Spacefront. All right, so Valder is Spacefront's best commander. It is one of their mains. It was extremely risky of Alsame Suzaku not to ban Valder, although I have to say this isn't really a Valder map. I don't know if Valder is that good on this map, and I don't know why you'd want to mirror Valder on this map, but maybe Spacefront will show me just how wrong I am in that assumption. Alsame goes for the classic wagon opening, which is something you want to do when you go horizontal with your commander as player 2 to get your commander to the important villages you can attack much earlier. However, Spacefront, if you notice, Alsame has captured these two villages down here. Spacefront has not done the same. The villages are completely neutral. This will give Alsame a huge econ advantage starting off. However, here's the catch, guys. Alsame won't be able to build Groove off of it. That being said, it's turn 5, and Spacefront hit a village on turn 5 when they would have gotten Groove anyway, so ultimately killing that village did almost nothing for Valder, though they did take out a sword based on how that play happened. Now, Alsame built Double Wagon here, which is extremely confusing to me. I don't know why they did that, but Alsame is famous for building wagons and using them in interesting ways, so I'm sure Alsame has a strategy that, oh, that you're using it to reposition a very early archer. That is very clever. We see Spacefront summoning a sword right away and going for that critical kind of near the tower village and capturing it. Very well played. That village is exceptionally difficult to flip. But if you can flip it early, it's very hard for your opponent to take it back. That'll give Spacefront the econ advantage going forwards. And as Valder, that's something you really, really want. As you can see, Spacefront is 200 gold ahead. And reminder, Spacefront is the blue Valder, guys, not the green one. Alsame Suzaku, meanwhile, is using a sword to take out one of the center villages. Unfortunately, that village is really easy to flip back, so it's not really permanent income in Alsame's pocket. But Alsame has a very scary formation here, pushing in on Spacefront's stronghold, which forces a retreat from Spacefront. That balloon is immortal, because Alsame did not build a mage in time that can reach this balloon and so has no way to kill it. Spacefront has a huge army here, and I think Alsame will have to back off, they just don't have the unit count to deal with this. Sure enough, Alsame repositions and moves Valder into the meat of Spacefront's villages, trying to reclaim territory and farm up some groove. With some very careful unit positioning, Alsame is trying to zone out Spacefront from being able to do the same thing and advance. And we see a very nice diagonal front here from Alsame. Spacefront ultimately retreats. And remember, I said we have to pay attention to the clock. Spacefront is at 36 minutes. That means they only really took 10 minutes for the first eight turns, which is actually really, really efficient. Both players have been playing very, very, very fast so far, which is uncharacteristic for both of them, although Osame is a little bit lower on the clock. Osame takes down double villages, regaining income and getting Valder Groove, putting Spacefront now behind. Additionally, Osame has a ton of economy and goes for a sword hit, knowing full well that Spacefront can counterattack into it. I wonder what Alsame has in mind, because their army is a little bit split up right now. Sp Spacefront bringing a thief into the fold! We see an early thief from Spacefront. Thieves are not always made on this map, but when they are, they're always interesting to see. Sure enough, Spacefront's able to rip right through that formation without a problem. Let's see if that actually affected the unit count a little bit. Um, so not accounting for the villages, it definitely did. Spacefront is now way ahead on unit count which is not something you want to happen to you when you're playing Valder, 
which means Alsame Suzaku is going to be at a huge disadvantage going forward. Alsame, with 24 minutes on the clock, is summoning swords. They take out the roost um, with their night crit and then capture it. They now have their opponent's rookery. Grab a free har um, harpy kill. Even if the mage dies, it's worth it. And use their own harpy just to block off some stuff. But ultimately, Alsame has a much smaller army and has to contend with the fact that Space Front can just swarm them now. Alsame builds a dragon to threaten off Space Front a little bit. We see insult to injury. Thief goes in. Ooh, crit on the mage. Really well done. And sword comes in to protect the knight so that the harpy cannot hit it. That harpy will have to retreat. Sword coming out. Big damage coming in. Crit on that village. And Space Front takes it with another mage. So even though Space Front did not decap their opponent's rookery, they have so many mages, it can't really build or be useful anyway. In fact, Space Front probably wants Alsame to build theirs. Now, if you're looking at this, Alsame is down on income, was just stolen from, and is about at minus 5 on unit count at the start of their turn. Not great all around. Alsame doing their best to just try to come back. They make another aggressive push into Space Front Stronghold, but I don't know if I like this because Space Front can just walk down and stop this from happening. I don't know what Alsami is going for, but they only have 12 minutes on the clock, so they're probably pressured on time and don't really have a choice because they can tell they're not going to win the long game against Space Front. The Harpy just retreats. It has to or it will die. Space Front has a very healthy 25 minutes on the clock, but having a high unit count is also means you have to move a lot of units! Oh, my voice is getting sore from narrating this game. This is intense. Space Front is moving and moving and moving all their units to defend the stronghold against this push. They just have to defend and they win the game if they do so successfully. Valder was very, very careful not to step on this road tile because it could potentially put them in murder range of the dragon. Even though the dragon probably wouldn't be able to reach, it still wasn't worth the risk. The knight very brazenly steps right in front of a bunch of pikes. I don't know why it did that. The dragon's just pushing in. Baldur's pushing in. I don't know what, what Alsame is doing. It doesn't make any sense. Alsame is just going crazy deep and building a dragon out of the, the, the... What is he doing? What's Alsame doing? Alsame is just trying to siege the barracks, but this isn't going to work. Space Run can just attack their stronghold. I guess when you only have six minutes on the clock, you've got to try something, and the stronghold was too protected, so Alsame was like, okay, I'll take your barracks. Space Front finally kills that mage anyway. Valder goes in. Yeah, sure enough, Space Front's just going for Alsame's stronghold. I mean, there's almost no reason not to. Takes out the balloon to prevent Alsame from being able to advance and boldly moves units forward just to, just to slow Alsame down. I mean, really, all Space Front has to do is do damage here, and they're getting so many free kills off this attack, it's not even funny. I think Alsame has been uh, quite defeated here. Their commander is trapped and probably can't even escape. And Space Front has plenty of time to close this game out in several different ways. So much damage coming out. Even a dog crit on a wagon. When does that even happen? And Space Front is just showing their zerg of an army rushing down Alsame Suzaku. We might see the surrender here, but Alsame is not one to surrender even with six minutes on the clock. And a hopeless solution, they are not one to give up. It's funny because there's actually mage crit on the, the enemy Valder right now. Alsame could have gone for that, but there was no kill. Uh, recognizing that there's no way to take a, a kill on the enemy commander, Alsame is just doing their best to free their own commander. And they're actually doing a good job of it. We see tons of damage coming out. This is actually really impressive. Valder summons a sword, but Alsame doesn't have enough time for this. I mean, this is a really impressive attack, but it's just taking too long. They do take down the barracks! Wall behind! This is insane! But it's... it's And they're fighting evenly into Space Front! Look at this! Look at this! They're even on economy, they're even on unit count. Alsame's insane play actually evened it up. And they took the same amount of time to do it as Space Front did. But ultimately, it was just about even at the end of their turn. Now Space Front gets to counterattack, and the counterattack is vicious. Oh, we're gonna see a mage crit on a dragon. Yeah, that dragon just goes down, which hits the other dragon. Savage, and Space Front is just destroying Alsame. Even if Alsame had more time, it wouldn't be enough. It's too much. It's just too much. Alsame is losing their entire army to this attack. There's nothing left. And Space Front continues to push forward, just overwhelming Alsame with the sheer numbers. 
Now, Space Front's gotta be careful. They're moving so many units, they might forget to end the game. Space Front 2 has to watch out for time, although the, as long as you're ahead on economy, you'll win sudden death. I don't think there's anything else Sami can do here. Just goes for a YOLO Hex. Puts their commander onto a river tile. That looks like a surrender. You're putting your commander onto a terrible tile next to an enemy giant. You're probably giving up the game. We see double hex coming out. And yeah, this is GG. So Space Front takes game one. I've got to say, that was an insane play by Alsame. But realistically, this game was over. This game was over at around, I don't know, turn 8 or 10. When Space Front just started winning trades and just had too much stuff. And was also ahead on time. But that was just game one. That was just these two warming up. Let's take a look at game two. We're going to switch maps to open season. Oh my goodness. All right, this is for all the marbles of Spacefront wins. In the top left, we have Valder again. Spacefront once again gets to play Valder and is in the blue. Alsame Suzaku is playing Elodie. I, I, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. I, oh, I, my heart is stopping right now. Elodie is considered one of the worst commanders in the game. And this is for the win. Alsame deliberately picked a terrible commander into one of the top tier commanders. If Alsame wins this game by some miracle against Spacefront, who is by no means going to be able to go easy on them, then Elodie might actually become meta, which would be hilarious. Right now, Elodie is considered like garbage tier. People always joke about Elodie, Dark Mercia, and Sigrid being the trio of terrible characters, um, with, uh, of course, Merciful in his own tier. Merciful tier as the worst character of all. Though Merciful wins memes, guys. I mean, Merciful will always win the meme contest, and that's why he's OP. Moving back to the game, we see Spacefront going for a very, very standard opening, though they deliberately did not um, capture this aggressive village, and it looks like neither did Alsame, but Spacefront is actually ignoring villages initially to do a hyper-aggressive commander push. Um, we've seen uh, Cleaner Code use that against me. Um, we've seen a, a bunch of different players use that where you ignore the village and go really, really deep with your commander early on. It can be a very powerful strategy if your opponent doesn't capture these villages and tries to deny you Groove. So Osama is going to get Groove one way or another. Meanwhile, Spacefront is playing Valder. Um, but has not been able to hit anything until turn 5, so they're going to get their first sword at the maximum possible time when they could get that sword, which is not great for Valder. As Valder, you want to try to get a sword before turn 6. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a way to do it on this map, though. And we also see Alsame damaging their own sword to take down another village, so their slow charge commander is already at 75% by the end of turn 5. I'm sorry, 80%. 80% groove while Valder just has their first sword. This could be insanely good for Alsame Suzaku. We see Valder just using the sword to damage a village, can't even take it out. Hold on! Look at the economy! Alsame is so far ahead on economy. Their opening definitely paid off. And they're getting even further ahead. Alsame builds a giant and is healing so many units, I'm not even sure if they're going to be able to do a double barracks build. They spend so much money on healing. Oh, they make a sword. Okay, they had just enough money for a sword. We see the rifles start to come into play. Alsame using the rifle to zone out Valder's swords. But Valder takes out another village and already has Groove again. Really well played by Spacefront, as long as they don't die. There's a joke about this map that the middle river tile is called the Koi Pond. And it's considered a death sentence to stand anywhere near it because of how easy it is to kill you if you're on or near the Koi Pond. Um, you might have seen... Players typing like Koi Pond OP in Twitch streams in competitive games. So that's a really scary place to be standing. I wonder if there was lethal if that dog could have been taken out. I'm not sure. Maybe not. Maybe not. Whenever you're standing next to the Koi Pond, I always wonder if there's lethal. So some good damage coming out. Uh, Space Run actually uses the rifle to hit Alsame's Knight. Not going to do a lot of damage, but might as well. And Spacefront is making really, really great use of Valder Groove and doing really careful Valder repositions to make sure they can Groove, hit a village, Groove, hit a village every single turn. Really well played by Spacefront. If they attack from the south of this village, then they can attack here next, or they can Groove here and attack either of these. They're playing Valder really, really nicely on this map. Whoa. 
A hex coming out on Valder and a couple of swords. I don't know why there's no kill here. It wasn't enough to kill that sword either. I'm really confused by that hex. I don't know why Alsame did it, but Alsame is... They're, they're still ahead on the monies if we if we take a look at the monies. They're beating Space Front by 600. The, the, the Econ is reversed. This time Alsame is way in the lead. Yeah, that, that Valder had like 95% health. I, I don't know if that Hex was worth it to bring Valder down to 95%. He'll just be back to full in a turn. But meanwhile, Elodie has Groove, and everything is running away so that Alsame doesn't steal their unit. Spacefront is going crazy defensive right now. And we, so we see Alsame pushing out. Did they miss builds that turn? Hold on a sec. Did, did, did they miss builds that turn? It looks like they missed builds. I, I'm not even sure if they're ahead on unit count. I think the unit count is about even, but... Uh, Space Run is playing Valder, so that's fine. You're not supposed to be ahead when you're not Valder and you're playing against Valder. Alsame also retreats, which is interesting. And is standing a little bit close to the Koi Pond. Oh, they gave up a rifle! Uh, sorry, they gave up a sword to Space Front's rifle. It's very easy to miss those snipes on this map, and Space Front advances, taking another village. Although, ultimately, Alsame is still really far ahead if we look at this economy. Um, 300 ahead, and up on units. Not in a great spot for Valder. Elodie has Groove, but Space Front's working really, really hard to make sure that nothing will ever, ever, ever let Elodie use Groove. <laughs> And we see Elodie with a really aggressive reposition towards the enemy Golem, possibly wanting to steal that Golem for herself. Very sneaky and mischievous. Alsame also has double witches, which will be very helpful in controlling the air and possibly giving a lethal on Valder. Ultimately, though, building double witches into a pile of mages is risky because you don't want to just randomly hex the enemy army. You could be feeding them suicides and you can't really kill anything with them. The giant just runs away from Elodie, which is hilarious, and Alsame loses another sword to a snipe. Mage takes down a balloon, which means Elodie's stranded there, and the pikes are doing some work clearing out some units. Ultimately, Spacefront got some good trades in there, and Valder gets to summon yet another sword to go in and attack something. We see Spacefront being very, very aggressive here, and I want to take a look at the unit count now. Sure enough, Spacefront has evened out the economy and the unit count and has swung the game in their favor. Maybe Alsame built too many witches because you can't really do anything with them. Oh, the hexes are coming out now, dealing some big damage. But we'll see whether or not Alsame's master plan is good enough to warrant this. So much gold being spent. Sword crit takes out sword. Really nice. Giant takes out sword. What is Elodie going to steal here? Steals a mage. Interesting choice. Suicide into sword. Dog takes out sword. Wait a minute. Dog crit takes out dog. Mage goes around. Double mage hit. That knight is in crit position. What was that? Insanely big brain play. Insanely big brain play. Those witches drop those units to just enough health to make each and every attack, each and every crit possible. How did Alsame do all that? That was such a big brain lethal. Oh, wow. I thought Space Front was winning after that turn. That trade was incredible. But Alsame just pushed for an incredible kill. Stealing not even a big unit, just a mage to reposition it to allow the mage to attack from below after a dog killed a unit. That was Hex just enough for the dog to kill it. And after a sword suicided into it to set up another dog crit on another unit so that the knight could crit where the mage was. That was amazing. That was amazing. I might have a rifle. I, I might have a rival for lethal master. Al Alsame with this is probably my lethal nemesis. That was insanely good. Okay, so they're tied. 1-1, and Alsame just won a game against a top-tier commander with frickin' Elodie. We've seen Dark Mercia. We've seen Elodie. I, I, I wonder what the heck they banned for this game that made that viable. We have got to see game three. Let's just go right now. No. 
Impossible. Impossible. Safe Haven. Game 3 on Safe Haven. Uh, and, and they're doing it again. They're doing it again. Valder is considered to be near broken on Safe Haven. And El Same did not ban Valder and allowed Safe Haven to happen. And is playing Elodie. If Osame wins this, they are just a legend. I, I don't know what else to say. Because, um, Spacefront should win this game just based on the commanders and the positioning and the strategies. This seems to favor Spacefront. I, I, I don't know what else to say. Spacefront is on their main. Or one of them, at least. All right, we see Spacefront doing some uh, uh, classic captures across the map. Um... We see them uh, steal and not use Valder to take out the village, which is correct, because if you use Valder, you're too far behind on economy. Going for the thief is the right option. Um, and they do that classic pattern of capturing this village and then moving the commander around. It's very good for an aggressive opening as player two into your opponent's territory. Um, though it does allow your opponent to start being aggressive into your territory, and Alsame is pushing very far in with Elodie and will end their turn with 50% groove. But Valder takes out a village and has a sword and is threatening to kill um, Alsame's stronghold. And then builds a dragon to defend their own and Alsame has no anti-air and has to back off. They back off but decap a village while they're doing it, which is very nice. Grabbing some more villages with their own swords. And using their own air unit, a much cheaper balloon, to protect the stronghold against Valder. Additionally, Alsame has captured the two center villages, unafraid of Spacefront's thieves, and Spacefront only made one thief. They did not go double thief. We see Spacefront's dragon coming into the mix, and Balloon Mage ready to deal some damage. Elodie decaps a village right next to the dragon, completely fearless, possibly because Elodie has Groove on turn 7, and can steal that dragon if it attacks anything near Elodie. Oh, the plays right now. Alsame has negated the worth of a dragon. Valder just suicides a sword into the enemy stronghold and then attacks it. Valder's going for a game-ending kill right now. I think they can do it, too. Oh, the steel gives the dragon the surround, and the dog finishes. Really big brain play there from Spacefront, using the thief to take out the village so the dragon could slip through. Yeah, ultimately... Ultimately, that was not the best setup from Alsame. Really great groove farm, but they kept their stronghold open to Spacefront. And Spacefront rushed with his main and won. I, I mean, knowing your opponent matters and picking Elodie matters, but oh, that, that game too was brilliant on Alsame's part. Ultimately, Alsame is not one of the most consistent players in Wargroove, but they are definitely one of the best. They repeatedly try crazy things, and when it works, they are the best player in the game. When it doesn't, they lose on turn whatever that was. Um, but if Osame can learn to play consistently, they will be a player unlike any other. They already are. That was incredible. That was space front. They, they beat Valder with Elodie in game two. That's not supposed to happen. That's not supposed to happen, guys. That's not how Wargroove works. Elodie might be meta now. Maybe not on safe haven, or maybe on safe haven. That would have been amazing if they could have defended the stronghold a little better. Yikes! All right, so Spacefront will be moving on. So, so far we have Shu, the previous world champion, moving on. Spacefront, the number one ladder player, moving on. Who are we missing? Oh, yeah! Sykoya, the legendary candidate who has just suddenly appeared and started taking out big names, who already has one win... Against Zeronix. You can see that win in my other video. Spoilers. Um, now has game two and three if it's a tie to play. Let's check them out. Alright guys. So these games are insanely intense. Um, this is going to be Zeronix versus Sequoia Part 2. I just said that. I'm just so excited. Okay. We see Sidewinder. Um, and Zeronix is playing Vesper. Vesper is one of those commanders that is not often played by newer players. Like Caesar, um, well, and I don't want to say like Caesar, because if you don't know what you're doing with Caesar, you can just die. With Vesper, if you don't know what you're doing, you won't just die. Maybe you can do something cool, it just won't be that effective. 
Um, but when Vesper is played at a very high level, Vesper is one of the best commanders. Uh, if, if you see my tier list, the only reason I didn't put Vesper near the top, um, or maybe I did, was because Vesper is not that good in anyone's hands. But when you really know what you're doing, Vesper is amazing. Vesper has stronghold rushes, commander kills, um, gimmicky commander kills, army kills. Vesper's Groove is very, very niche, but it can be used in some very awesome ways. Also, Zeronix is not opening like a normal person. Zeronix is opening by sending their commander around the left side of the map, which is not how you open on this map! What are you doing, Zeronix? Meanwhile, Sequoia does the normal thing and just sends their commander to the center. <laughs> Alright, so I have no idea what Zeronix is trying to accomplish. Um, but the economy is close to even. No, I'm sorry, Zeronix somehow has a lead. Because they've managed to capture their own villages early, even if they're losing on the contested villages. So they have an econ lead, somehow. That's kind of amazing, I don't know how Alsame did that. But they somehow made a really weird opening work and have an eco lead. And they seem to be keeping that lead from the looks of things. Uh, no, Sequoia's a little bit ahead right now. Actually, I take that back. Sequoia stole the lead. Um, but Zeronix was able to kill a sword and posture. Now threatening Sequoia's stronghold and these northern villages and units on the top left. Meanwhile, in the bottom right, Zeronix has a defensive archer and an aggressive harpy. Both will be able to be used against Night Mage to kind of threaten them off, and start taking these villages back. Zeronix has two villages here, but is missing all of them here. Um, starts decapping the center villages and the ones near their stronghold, putting the sword on the mountain, and the archer in a really vulnerable position. Can it die to that knight? I don't think it would be a worthwhile trade. Yeah, I don't think the archer dies because it's on flagstone, and the knight would die in the attempt. So that, that's actually a really smart position, because it looks risky, but... That archer is safe. Sequoia builds an aggressive dragon, which will prevent um, Zeronix from being able to stand on the road. <laughs> so how's Zeronix going to get to the other side of the map? I don't even know. <clears throat> Zeronix is just kind of forced back on the north side from that dragon. And we see them move a balloon into position so that they can kind of cheat around the road here and get to the other side. Because uh, otherwise there's nothing they could do. Meanwhile, Sequoia uses the force of the dragon to burst down these villages and reclaim economy on this side because it's very very clear that Zeronix is going to take over these whoa insane aggression from Mercia very very aggressive play that 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 balloon um can't die that mage is too low to kill this balloon even if it's healed so that balloon is invincible it's actually a genius positioning from Sequoia Zeronix realizes they can't attack, that just straight up ignores it and balloons themselves to the other side of the map to start taking down economy and taking down names. <clears throat> oh, I'm losing my voice. This is intense. Alright, so we see a massive setup for Zeronix on the right side of the map. And Sequoia is still a little bit split. They're dedicating their, their dragon to taking out this village to try to get economy against Zeronix. But they're, they're just too many units here. Using the balloon to reposition Mercy is a good call, but a lot of Sequoia's army is still vulnerable. Okay, yeah, the dragon retreats. It decides not to take down that village, because Sequoia is even on economy right now, and they need to be able to defend themselves from a fight. Vesper fearlessly marches forward, standing in the center forest tile, and puts a thief on the road. Really risky when the dragon's right there, and steals from Sequoia. If that thief can get away safely, and there is a balloon right there, though it can die. But if that thief gets away safely, that'll be a lot of gold in um, Zeronix's pocket. Yeah, Zeronix has a very clever formation here, because Sequoia can take some kills, but not that many. And ultimately, the counterattack would be brutal. Sequoia uses three units to take down that village and snipes most of a sword. But that can be mage crit by this mage, so Sequoia has to kill this mage. Or they're in trouble. It's kind of hard to see, but one, two, three, crit. Uh-oh. Yeah, this is looking really good for Zeronix right now. Uh, 
Sequoia builds a Ballista, but I, I don't think that's going to do anything for them. Yep, there's the Mage Crit. Dragon goes down. I think Sequoia just missed that because it was a little bit tricky to see. Balloons Vesper very aggressively and using the ballooned dog to get a dog crit. Knight goes in, dog goes in. So much damage coming out. And I don't think there's enough things to hit Vesper that could possibly hit Vesper. Most of Sequoia's army is just locked up over here and can't do anything. And Zeronix is taking out villagers. The economy is pretty even. That's not the issue here. The issue here is Zeronix is up on units and has a stronger unit comp, especially since that dragon just died. Meanwhile, Sequoia's army is in the wrong spot. That Ballista's in the wrong spot. Zeronix just kind of went around it and is attacking over here now. The Ballista's not going to get out in time. Zeronix is taking names across the map and... Sykoya is just kind of forced to move across the mountains. He gets a dog crit on a dog, but doesn't even kill it and can't finish it off. I, And that thief is definitely going to escape. The thief Zeronix stole with. I think this was really well played by Zeronix, but they're just closing out the game now. If Zeronix wins this, it'll be tied up. Remember, Zeronix lost game one. Very convincingly, actually. Oh, wow, is this it? This could be it right here. The Thief goes down, Dragon Strike for the win, there it is, yeah! Saronix very cleanly takes that game. Alright, let's look at game three. Wow, okay, so Sykoya and Zeronix are dead even, which is impressive because Zeronix was supposed to be unbeatable. They're the legendary player. It, it said that Shu won the last tournament, that the last two tournaments were won by non Zeronixes because of Zeronix either dropping or not participating, but those are just rumors. There are some dang good players. Zeronix can be beaten as Sykoya showed. Last match. Koji, who gave, what, how did Koji not get banned? Koji is kind of like Caesar and Ragna. You expect them to be banned in every game, but sometimes they slip through and you get a mirror match. All right, we see Koji coming out for both players. In the top left, in the green, we have Zeronix, and in the bottom right, yellow, we have Sykoya. Uh, this is for the win. This is for all of the marbles, guys. Whoever wins this makes it to the top four, and they will join Shu. They will join Spacefront. They will join the winner of Sneaky Dragon versus Spadius in the top four players in the world. This is an intense game. And both of these guys are folks I like and know and have practiced with. I don't want either of them to lose. These are my friends. <laughs> what? All the best players know each other, obviously. Who do you think we practice against? Anyway, um... So, for real, I, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know who to root for. I don't know what I want to happen. Admittedly, actually, um, Sequoia and I haven't practiced much this tournament with each other, but we practiced with each other for the previous tournament, and then unfortunately had to face each other um, in that tournament. Uh, and it was a very, very, very close match, and Sequoia has gotten a lot better since then. Right now, they're, they're not somebody I, I would feel confident fighting into. They're really, really good. And Zeronix... I, I count my wins against Zeronix, I'm not even kidding. Like, I think I've got, like, five now, maybe... Depends what I count as, like, a win, because sometimes they were picking, like, DM or something. Oh, my goodness. They, these are some top-level competitors, and, like, if I'm going to beat these guys in the finals, i got to step my... What am I talking about? We've got a game to narrate. All right, so, Zeronix is um, kind of just defending along their stronghold on the left side and solo pushing with their commander on the right. We see Sequoia going for turn 5 dragon. Hey, that's my strategy, and a turn late, gosh darn it. Um, and just taking some groove with their commander and pushing forward. Both commanders are about even on groove. Actually, Zeronix is ahead on groove. I don't even know how that happened. Somehow, Zeronix is ahead on groove. And is now ballooning their pikes to the center. Going for a pike-heavy strategy is really risky. Um, especially because, like, there's a rifle on this map. Whoa! Dragon strike into Koji! Huge damage! There, there's nothing Koji can do to kill that dragon right now, and a bunch of units are coming up. Rifle snipe on the sword. Doesn't kill it, though, because the rifle is too low. That rifle really needs to heal to be more effective. And Sykoya really has an army of mostly swords. I'm not sure how that'll work into an army of pikes. Balloon comes in, and lol. Koji just plops himself in that balloon to escape, to get out of here. Koji wanted out. 
Koji will not be able to hit anything or heal this turn. Sykoya has bought themselves a Koji free turn, which is very nice. They're able to use the dragon now to capture this village. They heal their rifle. They're pushing out. They're pushing forward. That rifle is still not in a good position because there's really no reason for uh, Zeronix's swords to stand here or here. Um, but it can move to a good position on its next turn. Meanwhile, um, Sykoya just trying to dodge this rifle, get Koji into a good position, but let's look at the economy. I think that Dragon butt Sykoya a little bit of an econ lead, wouldn't you say? Um, Zeronix is taking some of it back, but they were still down by a lot at the end of their turn, and that's economy they didn't earn. So Sykoya had a very good opening here and ultimately forced Zeronix back, but both players are on the cusp of getting groove. Zeronix is actually ahead of Sykoya, which is very impressive, and position their commander, so Sykoya can't really stop Zeronix from getting Groove first unless they back up. And they are choosing to back up, repositioning Koji in a position where they can hit a village, and getting away from all of Zeronix's nasty pikes. Sykoya even builds a witch, even though Zeronix doesn't have that much of an air force, although I guess they also built a witch, so mirrored witch, and this witch will protect the dragon against that witch. It can be used to hex kill against Koji. And once the bombs come out, witches will be essential. Because witches can one-shot Koji bombs unless they're protected by a witch. There's so much anti-air meta that goes into this. Tons of mages and Koji moving to the top right of the map. And Zeronix starts taking villages in the bottom. And we see that it's turn 9. Both players have only used about 10 minutes. They're playing very fast and very efficiently. Zeronix is slightly ahead. But Zeronix even, uh, sorry, Sykoya evens it up. Both players are evening it up, attacking, defending, moving around every single turn. They're playing so incredibly well. You can tell that these are two of the best Wargroove players, and they are determined to win this game and make it to the top four. Suicide into the mage just so that a sword crit can take it out. No, it lives with 3% health. The witch could have hexed to kill it, but chose not to. That mage is probably dead anyway. And also keep in mind, Koji's standing on a bridge, not a road, so this dragon cannot crit it. And even if it could, I don't think there's any kill follow-up. Zeronix retreats a little bit on the left, pushing a little bit on the right, and has Groove. Sykoya does not have Groove yet. Just got it. Sykoya just got Groove. Whoa. That dragon is standing next to a Koji with bombs and a witch that can smack it. Really risky. Sykoya is risking their dragon right here. I wonder what they're up to. Mage moves into position, but then again, Zeronix is kind of like, their commander is here? Their army is here? I don't know how that's going to work. Alright, Zeronix just moves the heck back and summons Koji Bombs. And they probably plan on attacking this village next to build towards a second groove and try to get double Koji Bombs. The Koji Bombs move across the map and are protected by the Witch, um, so that they can't go down to an enemy Witch which is a very nice and very powerful formation, and then just kind of reshuffles around the swords a little bit. But Zeronix is dropping on their clock. They're approaching that 20-minute mark, and they're already at halftime. If we take a look at Sykoya's clock, Sykoya has five minutes to take this turn and just be even with Alsame. Bombs are coming out for Sykoya, and with careful positioning, those bombs will not be able to be killed. We see a witch protecting one of them, and the other I don't think can be hit on two sides by Antier and is therefore safe. We see Sequoia moving very, very, very aggressively towards the enemy stronghold, and they're putting their dragon in deliberately risky situations. Maybe they're, like, trying to bait out Alsami's witch. They're trying to bait out the bombs. They're like, come on, attack my dragon. It'll be worth it. Ignore the two mages I have here for the counterattack. You can do it. Gunbate. All right, so we see Zeronix moving forward, trying their best to just take villages and defend their stronghold against this pushing Sequoia. The bombs are slowly inching their way forward, and remember, bombs can go over flagstone. They have the hover movement type, which is unique to them. This is such a good match, but Zeronix has dropped down to 16 minutes, and Sykoya is still at 22. Sykoya has time, Sykoya has momentum, we see a rifle snipe come in, and the bombs are being used to protect Koji so that they don't die. Sykoya is doing really, really, really well. If we take a look at the economy, Sykoya is up on economy. They're both about even on Groove. Sequoia has a really nice army. They're taking kills. They're taking names. The dog goes down. Good plays are happening. And Sequoia is controlling the center of the map. Zeronix's army is a little bit split. This is a really good position for Sequoia to be in. We see Knight takes down a dog. Pike takes down a village. Pike crits a sword. 
Whoa, Asami's going really deep here. And that archer can definitely snipe a thing or two. Sorry, the rifle can definitely snipe a thing or two. Yep, Pike goes down. Or was that a sword? I think that was a sword. Zeronix took a lot of units this turn. Let's take a look at the unit count. It doesn't matter! Sequoia was up on units! Those kills just put them even, and they were mostly swords and like a dog. Let's see how Sequoia counterattacks this. The rifle reloads, so it can't kill anything this turn. Zeronix does have double witch, and Sequoia only has one. The uh, pike hurts itself a little bit to take out that pike. And then it gets taken by a dog, and we see Sequoia just reverse pike critting their way through Alsame's pikes. Big damage coming out. Pike crit on a mage. Sword finishes off that dog, and now Hex comes out. Huge damage. That does leave a lot of suicides, though. Oh, I don't like that. Koji is so far forward right now. Koji is too far forward right now. Why is Koji so far forward right now? Insane damage is coming out, but... Ah, even on a mountain tile, that looks scary. However, Sequoia did a great job defending that. There's bombs protected by witches. They've done insane damage to Zeronix's army. And Koji's on a mountain. It looks pretty safe. But Rifle snipes the mage, and unfortunately, because of the mountain, double suicides are very possible. There are hexes. There are Koji bombs. And this is not looking good. The Koji bombs come in. The knight comes in. And it's over. That was an amazing turn by Sequoia. But they couldn't put their commander there. That was a really risky spot. Especially after hexing, it just gave them suicides. The Koji bombs were right there, and you really can't face check Koji bombs with commander. Double witch, Koji bombs, double suicide. He only needed one side to hit on. There, there, there were other things that could have hit. That was GG. Oh, I am so sad for Sequoia. So happy for Zeronix. That was an incredible play. Sequoia just overextended a little bit with their commander there, and they got lethaled. Well played to both players. Zeronix, the legendary player of Wargroove, is going on. So... Who's in the top four right now? Who is in the top four in the world still in this tournament? We have the legendary player Zeronix, the current world champion Shu, the top ladder player Spacefront, and one of the sneaky dragon or Spottius. I wonder which one, guys. I wonder which one. You'll just have to stay tuned until I can figure out how to record my own games, because that's actually really hard to do for some reason. I hope you guys enjoyed these insanely epic games to see who makes it into the top four in Groove of War 5. Welcome to War Groove. And cheer on your favorite player. And watch some more games. I'll catch you guys later. Any questions you have, plop them in the comments. Um, I'm really busy at work right now, so it might take me a day or two to get back to you, but I will try. And of course, you could always ping me in the various Wargroove discords. Catch you later.